Thank you so much. You'll take the word of God and go with me. Psalm 77. I enjoy hearing that song, don't you? And uh, thank God for the blood of Jesus Christ. And it washes away all sin. And as uh, still meditating on the Lord's table last Sunday evening, and uh, I believe God is moving in my heart to do some preparation and study on the blood of Christ. Uh, but tonight I believe God has directed us to Psalm 77. It says here in Psalm 77, Asaph was inspired by the Holy Spirit to, to write these, these words here. It says, I cried unto God with my voice, even unto God with my voice, and he gave ear unto me. In the day of my trouble I sought the Lord. My soul ran in the night and ceased not. My soul refused to be comforted. I remembered God and was troubled. I complained and my spirit was overwhelmed. Thou holdest mine eyes waking. I am, all, I am so troubled that I cannot speak. I have considered the days of old, the years of ancient times. I call to remembrance my song in the night. I commune with mine own heart and my spirit made diligent search. Will the Lord cast off forever? Will he be favorable no more? Is his mercy clean gone forever? Doth his promise fail forevermore? Hath God forgotten to be gracious? Hath he, anger shut, hath he in anger shut up his tender mercies? And I said, this is my infirmity, but I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember the wonders of old. I will meditate of all thy work and talk of thy doings. Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? Thou art the God that doest wonders, that hast declared, thou hast declared thy strength among the people. Thou hast with thine arm redeemed thy people, the sons of Jacob and Joseph. The waters saw thee, O God. The waters saw thee. They were afraid. The depths also were troubled. The clouds poured out water. The sky sent out a sound. Thine arrows also went abroad. The voice of thy thunder was in the heaven. The lightnings lightened the world. The earth trembled and shook. Thy way is in the sea, and thy path in the great waters, and thy footsteps are not known. Thou ledest thy people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. I want you to notice in verse 2 as I take the title for this message this even, evening, in the day of my trouble. In the day of my trouble, I tell you, if there's one thing that would describe this day and age, I think this is a day of trouble, not just in general, but in specifically for so many people. I believe the Lord has directed my heart toward this just because even in, in the past few days, we've been dealing with people who have suffered what we would call the loss of loved one, who have received some terrible diagnosis from a doctor. They have seemingly no, no earthly help, and I'm sure in their heart, Maybe when they're alone, maybe when they're away from people, they literally are crying out to Almighty God. And they're asking some of the very questions that Asaph asked. God, have you forgotten me? Have you forgotten where I am? And the answer is a resounding no. God has not forgotten us. I want to ask you this question. Does Jesus care? Oh, yes, he cares. I know he cares. His heart is touched with my grief. It, it is. There's no question. That's our God. In the day of trouble, I, I don't know how else to explain it except that I sense this is a message that is needed in the heart of our church. It's needed in the heart of our church. I know for sure it's needed in my own heart. We, we, need, to be, we, need, to, we need to have, we need to be prepared even if we're not uh, having a sense of our great distress. We need a preparation for it all. But when we think about this, we think about Asaph and what he's saying here, crying unto God in the day of trouble, sore running in the night, his soul refused to be comforted. It sounds like a person that we would say is depressed, is depressed. And that's a word sometimes we use a little loosely. Sometimes we use that word just a little bit loosely. Certainly that term has a medical, can be a medical diagnosis. There can be a, a clinical terminology that someone can be diagnosed with being depressed, and there are ways to deal with that. By the way, I'm not here to refute that. I think in some situations that, that is absolutely a viable situation. And sometimes in God's house, among God's people, we, we tend to shame that sort of thing. But there, there are some chemical issues that people truly deal with that need a medical solution. And, and that is something that God has provided. And I'm glad that God has made that available through, through technology. And I think we just need to leave those things with the Lord. Many of us have, have, have decided that we have, have the, mel the medical knowledge of a PhD, of a, of a doctor. And often we fall very short of that. Very, very short of that. It's better to stick with the experts. 
no question. But sometimes we think about being depressed, and it can also refer to a temporary feeling of being very sad or very ap- apathetic. Just, just a lingering darkness that sometimes comes over us because of a difficult situation in life, because of something dark that's taken place in life. And we may find ourselves in the place of Asaph crying out to God and wondering if God has forgotten us. For some people, uh, this is, is something they deal with, certainly, and, and for all of us at one time or another, we deal with this persistent feeling of sadness. And any hint of depression around the church, and usually we say to somebody, you just need to have more faith. Remember, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Everyone ever given you that good advice, but it just didn't seem to work. Now, we, we can rely on God's word. Sometimes we give a, give a pep talk to people. Now, come on, you just need to get up and get going. If you'll, get, if you'll do something, if you'll just stop sitting around and, and twiddling your thumbs, stop thinking about your problems, just start doing something, everything will be better. Stop the pity party. Pull yourself together. What will people think about God if they see you acting like this? Well, I want you to know that depression is something that people don't want to talk about very much. The state of sadness and difficulty, we not talk about it very much, but you're in pretty noble company when you deal with these types of feelings. Let me name a few people. Have you ever heard of a man named Abraham Lincoln? He, he, had, he had his hands full, but well before he dealt with the darkness in this nation, he dealt with some real darkness in his own life. You can read some of his personal letters and understand some of the things he dealt with. Theodore Roosevelt. When I think of Teddy Roosevelt, I don't, I don't think about this at all, but this is something he battled in his own life. This robust president that traveled the world hunting big game seemed to be the life of the party, if you look at the pictures. But he dealt with this as well. Uh, others that we may have heard of, of, like Ludwig von Beethoven or Edgar Allan Poe, others people that have achieved great things, even men like Mark Twain, Vincent van Gogh, these people struggled mightily. Struggled mightily. And by the way, even in God's, God's faith hall of fame, we have some folks that struggled in a mighty way. Go back with me to Numbers chapter 11 and verse 15. God used the life of Moses in a great way, didn't he? He was a man that was on the backside of the desert, yielding himself to God. He came out to lead the children of Israel, but God gave him a job that was greater than he could handle. It was, it was a greater work than he felt like that he could do. In fact, working with those folks, working with those people, drove him to his knees and to despair. And he says to God here in, in Numbers 11 and verse 14, he says, I am not able to bear all, bear all this people alone because it is too heavy for me. And if thou deal thus with me, kill me, I pray thee. Out of hand, if I have found favor in thy sight, and let me not see my wretchedness. He was asking God to take him out of this world. Moses, who held up the rod and the staff, and the Red Sea parted at God's command. Moses says, take me out of here. He was dealing with something very strong in his life. Very, very strong in his life. If you look over in 2 Kings chapter 19, we remember about Elijah. He prayed those 63 words on Mount Carmel, and fire fell from heaven and consumed that altar and all those barrels of water and all that was there, and people were running to and fro. But in 1 Kings chapter 19, it says here in verse 4, But he himself, this is Elijah, went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die. And said, "Is It, it is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. I'm not better than my father's. In Jonah chapter 4, you remember the story, the account of Jonah given in God's word. In verse chapter 4, it says here in verse 1, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. He was upset that God had saved and redeemed some people that he didn't think was worthy of it. And he prayed in verse 2 unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, before I, excuse me, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live in the day of trouble. I don't recommend these thoughts, but they are thoughts that we have. Sadness is a part of life, and it is still a part of the Christian life. I remind you of our Lord Jesus Christ. Would you go with me over to John chapter 11? I was reading through this a little bit more recently. Remind me, class, in John 11, what dear friend of the Lord Jesus Christ passes away? Lazarus. Lazarus. Dear friend of the Lord Jesus Christ. And his sisters had sent this message to him. And the Lord Jesus Christ delayed. He said, 
when, he, when verse 4 of John 11, when Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When he heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. You say, this doesn't sound like the love of God, but God had a purpose, his glory to be revealed. You say, what was going on here? What was going on here? And in verse 30 of this same chapter, now Jesus was not yet coming to town, but was in that place where Martha met him. And the Jews then, which were with her at the, in the house and comforted her when they saw Mary, that she rose up hastily and went out, followed her, saying, she goeth into the grave to weep there. And then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. And when Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, Listen, he groaned in his spirit and was troubled and said, Where have you laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. And maybe, the, maybe the, one of the most famous verses in the Bible, two words, the shortest verse, Jesus wept. Trouble. In the day of trouble, this is something that we have, we have to acknowledge that we can and will deal with. And instead of just pushing it aside and saying this, is, this has no place in God's family, let's say some of God's most choice servants dealt with trouble and disturbance in their spirit. And if it was not for the grace of Almighty God, they would have never become the Christian, the person that we imagined that they were. They dealt with trouble just like you and I do. And I believe here in Psalm 77, as God moved in Asaph's life to write these words and to pen these words under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, I believe we have some help for us. Number one, we see his situation. It was an impossible situation. I cried unto God with my voice, even to God with my voice, and he gave ear unto me in the day of my trouble, my trouble. I sought the Lord, my sore ran in the night, and ceased not. My soul refused to be comforted. I remembered God and was troubled I complained and my spirit was overwhelmed. My spirit was overwhelmed. Thou holdest mine eyes waking. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. This was the situation. This is one of God's choice servants, by the way. Asaph, mightily used of God. By the way, he appears on the list of people that the Holy Spirit inspired to write Holy Scripture. And he said, I didn't even want to think about God. I couldn't even talk to God. My heart was broken. He needed God in his day of trouble. That's the situation. And in our own lives, we get there, we get there often. But God didn't intend for us to stay there. And God has made a way for us to find his peace and his joy in all that takes place. We see the situation. It was a difficult and desperate situation. One of the things I, I want to be able to say, and God helped me to say it in the right way, but don't make bad worse by beating yourself up for having these feelings. Right. I'm going to try to say that again, but don't make bad worse. I'm not sure if that's even good grammar or not, but let me say it again. Don't make bad worse by beating yourself up for having the feelings that are in your heart. You can correct me later. Straighten me out just a little bit later there, if you would, Mr. Schaefer. He's, he's working on it. I can see him computing there. I'll probably be avoiding you after this meeting. I don't, I don't know if I can get this correct. But isn't that true? Isn't that what happens often? I mean, I understand it, and, and I understand that some folks have, have a habit of playing the victim. If it wasn't for victimhood, they wouldn't have a life. Do we all know someone like that? I mean, of course there's no one like that in this room, but we all know someone like that somewhere. If it wasn't for victimhood, they wouldn't have a life. But I'm not talking about that sort of thing. Don't make bad worse by trying to beat, beating yourself up for the feelings you have when, when times are tough. When the way is dark, God has a purpose in those feelings. God has a purpose in that disappointment. God, God has a way for you to come through it and come out of it. He does. And, it's, it is, and again, the list I've read you already, much less the people that maybe have, have fame in world history and certain people that were used mightily of God. This is something that mighty, mighty warriors of God, mighty soldiers of Almighty God could have dealt with in their own spirit. And we certainly are no better. Don't, let me say again, don't make bad worse by beating yourself up for the feelings that are in your heart. That's, things are bad enough as they are. That's just some personal advice. That's the situation. I think we ought to take the, take the next step as we try to step out of this big hole and go here into verses 5 through 9 and begin the searching. Asaph began searching. 
He said, I've considered the days of old, the years of ancient times. I call to remembrance my song in the night. I commune with my own heart and my spirit made diligent search. Will the Lord cast off forever? And will he be favorable no more? Is mercy clean, gone forever? Doth his promise fail forevermore? Hath God forgotten to be gracious? Gracious hath he in anger shut up his tender mercies? We see that word selah, that we can meditate on this, and we know the answer to every one of those questions. I'm glad there's nothing wrong with asking those questions. There's nothing sinful about asking those questions. There's nothing irreverent about asking those questions. And the yielded spirit that God would give us, the search, and we ought to search God out and think about it. He was on his way. He had made a step off the bottom rung. I believe he stepped up on the next rung of the ladder to come out of this pit of despair and trouble. He was now just coming out of the situation and began searching out God, and he's soon going to remember who God is. Asking those sort of questions, thirdly, gives him a strategy. There's a strategy here in verse 10. He said, and this is my infirmity, but I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember the wonders. I will meditate also of all thy work and talk of thy doings. Whether it makes you feel better or not, you ought to do exactly what our dear brother is recommending here. Remember God and what he has done already. What he's done already. Just a moment, there's a reference here that, that refers to uh, at the ending of this chapter, as we read it just a moment, a re- reading of this psalm, we're referring to the children of Israel and the crossing of the Red Sea. We talk about it just, just like it's just like we walk across the street, they walked across the Red Sea. But put yourself in the feet, in the shoes of those people who left everything behind. And by the way, the, the Egyptians loaded them down with, with lots of favors, lots of goods. As they pushed them out of Egypt after all those plagues and that that plague of the death of the firstborn, the Passover that was initiated. And they left out of Egypt and started there across the desert and they came up across the Red Sea. And at Pi Hiaroth, they were were backed up against an 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 insurpassable wall of water. They could not get over. There was nowhere to go. And Pharaoh's army is bearing down. They could hear the rolling of chariot wheels. They knew impending doom was coming. They, they were not a fighting people. They had been enslaved. There was no help. There was no hope. And occasionally we look at a situation and there are no answers. There is no solution. We're not smart enough to stop, to stop what's happening. We're not smart enough to get out of it. We're not smart enough to fix this at all. And it's impossible. But what we can do is stop and remember what God has done in the past. God look, did the impossible. He took an, an impassable body of water and split it in half. That's what God's word tells us. We know, this, we know the account well. God took an impassable body of water and split it in half. Again, I just want to just think about it. If we were to drive up 17 today and come across to the James River, and the James River Bridge is not there. Some of us, that would be a blessing if it wasn't there. We're just we're not going to drive across that thing anymore. My life will be a lot better without all that. That's another sermon for another day. But imagine coming to the shores of the James River. We have to get across. There's no bridge there. I want you to imagine God just parting those waters and allowing us to go through in a time of great need. Miles across, impassable, without some sort of help. And listen, that's exactly what God did. We pass over, but that's what we remember about God. And I want you to think about, in just a moment, I want you to think about for yourself, when has God done the impossible in your own life? Now, we know he brought us, he, he, he did something that we can't do for ourselves. He saved us if we've trusted him as our Savior. He did the impossible for us by giving us eternal life. That means we recognize that Christ died on the cross for our sins, that he was buried and that he rose again. We put our faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We ask Christ to forgive our sins. We ask for his record to be put on our account, and we entered the family of God. That was something that was impossible. Only Jesus accomplished that. That's a remarkable thing. But I want to go beyond that for just one moment. I want you to arrive at some other, maybe maybe not not as impassable as your eternal salvation, I realize but some impossible situation that God allowed in your life. Or maybe it's sitting in front of you right now. I don't know. We have some friends right now that are dealing with impossible situations. There's a dear lady going to go back in the hospital tomorrow and start a second round of chemotherapy that almost took her life in the first round. But she's headed back there tomorrow morning. She'll check into the hospital and start all that again. There's a precious little girl sitting in a pediatric ICU unit just a few miles from here. 
with really an inoperable situation, and it's going to take the help of God. Amen. It's an impossible situation. I don't know, have you had something like that in your life? Uh, maybe it would not compare, but it, was, it had gripped your heart just as strong as anything else could. You, maybe you were about to lose it all. Everything that you thought God was building in your life and that you were putting together. Maybe it was a job that was gone. Maybe a relationship that was gone. God brings us there for His glory and for our good. I want you to dwell on it here for just a moment. I don't want you to get back down to that pit of despair, that situation. God, God helped you to begin the searching your way out and He gives us a strategy to remember. Let's sit and remember when God delivered us in an impossible time. And it is true, young people, it's true, and whoever's listening in this room, you will come to an impossible time in your life. And it uh, really is a gift from God. I can testify I've been right there. Right there. All, all, all everything that my life was building toward was just about to disappear. Just about to disappear. It was hanging by a thread. Hanging by a thread. Thank God for prayer and people who were praying. But God came through in an impossible situation and made, didn't make bad better. He made bad great. Amen. He did a mighty work in my life. It was an impossible. It might as well have been the Red Sea there. There was no Moses around. There was no staff. There wasn't even a good wind to move the water back and forth as some people would try to, try to say about that Red Sea experience. There was nothing. Nothing but God. And I'm here to say it is enough. It was enough. Every once in a while when something I don't like is taking place, I would have to say in my own life, I've not come up against anything like that again. Thank the Lord. I hope I never do again. I hope I never do. But if I do, I understand it will be for God's glory and for my good. But every once in a while I'll come up against something I just don't like or I don't think is good or something I don't care for, something that makes that turns my stomach. I remember God, God did that, and there's no, no one can take that away from me. God, God did it. By the way, he could do it again if he needed to. I remembered. I can always remember that moment just a few years ago when God rescued me. God helped me. It changed my life completely. I remember finding Psalm 86, 17. I've referred to it many times. I, I, I was so desperate for God to answer my prayers. I, I didn't need everything all at once. I was just looking for any little nugget anywhere that was going to turn something around. I remember Psalm 86, 17. He said, and he talked about those little tokens for good. And I, 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 God started dropping little tokens here and there. He gave me the green light to make some strong and difficult decisions. He gave me some tokens for good, but God did it. I just want to say and testify one more time that God can bring you up. Remember at that point, that impassable point, what God did, and he can do it again. Amen. Some of us tonight are hunkered down, and we're in a situation that is not, at the very best, it's not pleasing. At the very worst, it's impossible. And it's right there. I can see it on your face. God can see it in your heart. We need to know who God is and what he's done, friend. And we need to be able to wait on the Lord. And God does some wonderful things when we do that. Go to Romans chapter 5. You remember this precious, precious verse, these precious verses in God's word? I give glory to God for breaking through in my life. Glory to God. No one else could have done it but the Lord. Nobody else could have done it but the Lord. I, I don't know where I'd be and what I'd be doing today. I wouldn't be doing this. I wouldn't be doing what I think God had given me to do with my life. I really thought in those moments I started to question God. Just like, hey, God, is, was I wrong about all this? Certainly there were a lot of things I needed to straighten out in my own life in that situation. A lot of things I'm responsible for. But God confirmed some things. He, he, he stayed with me and pulled me through. Give glory to God. But Romans chapter 5, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations. Not natural, it's a supernatural reaction to tribulations. We glory in tribulations also. Knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Patience, experience, and experience, hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength, 
in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Again, our eternal rescue. But I want you to understand that progression there. We've spoken of it before. We glory in tribulation because tribulations work patience. We have to wait on God and let him do his perfect work. If God didn't slow us down and stop us, we would never see God do anything in our life. If he didn't break our heart and slow us down, we would never, there would never be time for God to do his perfect work. Tribulation work is patience, waiting on the Lord. Wait on the Lord and be of good courage, for he shall strengthen your heart. Is that still in the book? Wait on him. Patience, we're waiting on him. Patience gives us experience, and patience experience. While we're waiting, we have an experience with God. I'm talking of experience with God in general terms, but I had an experience with God that no one can take away from me. No one. It changed my life, my Christian life, remarkably. I had a whole fresh new vision of the power of God in my life and what could be accomplished when God did his mighty work. I had that experience, and you can try to talk me out of it, but you won't be able to. God broke through. God broke through. I have my own experience with God, and I thank God for his word. My experience does not overshadow God's truth, and I can have an experience that goes outside of the boundaries of God's truth, but I had an experience with God that proved to me who he is in my life. And I'm convinced that God loves me, and I'm convinced that he wants his best for me, and I'm convinced that he can make a way when there is no way. I had that experience with God. I had to get down deep in a bad, pitiful situation before I would experience it and truly believe it. But God did it. In the day of trouble, God can be leaned on. Listen, we have, patience gives us experience, and that experience gives us hope. Hope an assurance about who God is and how God acts and the fact that he loves me just as much as he loves anybody else in this world. And he's paying as much attention to me and my trouble just as much as he is anybody else in this world. Hope, and I know that when this comes around again, anything that is anything near to it, anything that would be nearly as difficult, I know God's done it before and God can do it again. As I repeat myself, God's done it before, he can do it again. That's the hope that we have. And hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. And God does something in your heart to enlarge your heart to be a better minister for his glory and a better servant for his glory. There's a great purpose in it. Listen, there was a situation Asaph was in, and he began searching. He, there's a strategy that God gives us. Remember what God has done. And when we begin to remember, number four, we remember that God is an all-sufficient God. Amen. The sufficiency of God. I've all, already made that point clearly, but look what God says in his word. Verses 13 through 20. Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Later on it says, Thy way, O God, is in the sea. The way of God. We experience His sufficiency in the sanctuary. His way is a way of sanctifying us and holiness. Sanctifying us, meaning He's cleansing us. There's a purifying process. In my, my day of trouble, there was a purifying process, a painful purifying process that took place in my life. Painful. But it was purifying. It was sanctifying. Now listen, I have to go back, and, and the Lord has, still has to deal with me all the time. I've not reached any, anywhere near any level of perfection, nothing close to it. I want you to understand, I went through a purifying and sanctifying time. That's what Asaph is describing here. God's way is in the sanctuary in a sanctifying way. God leads us in his grace, and from his grace, he gives us God's glory. He makes no mistakes. Amen. His way is the best way. It always has been, and it always will be. And if we are living in the sanctuary, God's way, in the holy of holies, we'll be able to discover God's way. We'll be able to hear God's voice. We'll be able to obey God's will. If we're in God's holy word, we can have a holy walk with him. And may we sing with a true heart, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. Pure and holy, tried and true with thanksgiving. I'll be a living sanctuary for you. God's way is also in the sea. In the sea, it means some of the hidden ways of God, some of the things that we don't always understand about the Lord. By faith, we, we, by faith, we see the greater reality of God's plan, even in the midst of our sadness and what we would call depression. But God is far greater. God is far greater. He's at work. He's always victorious. In John chapter 16 and verse 33, the Bible says here, These things have I spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Listen, we are permitted to call trouble for what it is. One of the things I don't want to do is put on some fake 
phony Christian mask and act like I never have any trouble. Let me stop just a moment and say this. It does such a disservice to, to newer Christians and to younger Christians. And we, we always hide our trouble. Now, I'll be honest with you. It's a great temptation as someone who serves the Lord, we don't want to. We don't want to talk about negative things. We want. We, we don't want to show anything poor that's going on in our life. There, there should be no deficits in the life of someone who's serving God, as someone who'd be called a preacher. But my friend, there are. There is. There's no question. We we must remember that. But we don't. We that does being being in this valley of trouble, this time of trouble. We don't have to put on a fake mask. We don't have certainly don't have to tell a lie. But we we don't have to forget God either. We don't have to pace on a smile and ignore the feelings of emptiness. We don't have to neglect even the treatment that we might need medically. We don't have to ignore what's going on in our life. We don't have to deny the facts. But, but I say this as well. Being of good cheer does mean that we can bring all our pain to Almighty God. We can continue to trust in Him. We can believe that what He says about Himself uh, and about us is true. Even we don't feel like it is, the facts don't change. Getting the help we need is okay. We can be of good cheer. And when we encounter difficulties, we ought not to think, I'm a good person. I'm trying to do right. I don't deserve this. Remember, there is none that doeth good. No, not one. Romans chapter 3 and verse 12. If we all got what we deserve, what would it be, class? We would be in hell. That's true. If we got exactly what we deserve. So let's not say, I don't deserve this. I didn't deserve this. I went through trouble in my life, and I could say, I might say erroneously, I didn't deserve this. Truth is, I deserve worse than that. I deserve worse than that. Much worse. But thank God for His grace. God puts His children in precarious positions on purpose. In precarious positions on purpose. Not to destroy our faith, but to strengthen it. The day of trouble is all about strengthening us to help us step across the threshold and to find His sustaining grace in our difficult circumstances. It's not wrong to have trouble. It's not wrong to be depressed, but it is wrong to give up on God when we're depressed. I love 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Would you go there with me? Second Corinthians chapter 12, the Apostle Paul we, we think of him as a giant in the faith, but he had so many struggles. And he had this thorn in the flesh, right? Had this thorn in the flesh. Verse 7, and we'll begin there in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He said, unless I should be exalted above measure, through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. The psalmist in Psalm 43 writes, Why art thou cast down on my soul, and why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God. Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. In the day of trouble, we, we might be in an awful situation. The world might be falling apart. We need to be searching God, asking God those questions. Nothing wrong with asking those questions. Remember God. That's the strategy. Remember remember who God is and what God's done and what he can do. And then remember that God is all sufficient. God is all sufficient. He's never made a mistake yet. He's never made a mistake yet. And I, I think to myself, if God had given me everything that I wanted in my life, I would be in a world of hurt at this moment. If God had even given me most things, many of the things I'd prayed for, He always knows best. He makes no mistakes. I love the, I love the song, He maketh no mistake. My Father's way may twist and turn. My heart may throb and ache, but in my soul I'm glad to know he maketh no mistake. My cherished plans may go astray, my hopes may fade away, but still I'll trust my Lord to lead, for he doth know the way. 
Though night be dark and it may seem that day will never break, I'll pin my faith, my all in him, for he maketh no mistake. There's so much now I cannot see. My eyesight's far too dim. But come what may, I'll simply trust and leave it all to him. For by and by the mist will lift and plain it all he'll make. Through all the way, though dark to me, he made not one mistake. And when we stand before God in what we would call eternity future, that's what we will be able to say honestly. He made no mistakes. Genesis 18, 25, I've been rehearsing it lately with people who've been dealing with things that don't seem like they're even fair. But it says this, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Someday, friend, even though we can't necessarily do it today, someday we will agree with God about everything that's taken place on this earth. Everything that he's allowed in our life, even though it's distasteful, in this moment, though it's distasteful, it may, may, have, may, have, may have put us in a different direction, but someday we'll stand before God and agree with him about everything that's taking place. And you may think of some awful tragedies, but we'll look back and say, you know, God knew exactly what he was doing. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? That's another question that we can say resoundingly, yes to. Yes. Asaph was moved to the Holy Spirit to pen this psalm, and he faced a problem that seemed bigger than his God, but by the, we, by the time we get down to verse 20, we realize that God was bigger than all his problems. Amen. And God is bigger than your distress. Amen. God is bigger than your trouble. Amen. I'm here to testify that God will bring you through. Amen. And he makes no mistakes. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Lord, thank you for this passage. Thank you for the, your word. If we did not have the word of God, where would we be in the day of trouble? Lord, I pray for my friends. There are some confused and hurting people, no doubt, in this room this evening. Confused and hurting people under the sound of my voice. Lord, I pray they would take this psalm into their heart. Your Holy Spirit could teach it so much better than I. I pray that they would read it and meditate on it. Lord, I pray that you would work in our hearts. Lord, help us not to stay in that awful pit of despair. Help us, Lord, to remember who you are and to realize how sufficient you are. No matter what our thorn may be, help us to praise you for it, Lord. And help us not to despair. Help us not, not to sin against thee. Help us, not to, us, help us to not doubt thee. Help us to agree with thee. We ask for grace to do so. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. I want to remind you that your greatest impassable, impassable need is your salvation. Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Have you on purpose trusted Christ as your personal Savior? Have you recognized that you are a sinner and that you need God's salvation? Have you personally called on Him in salvation? Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Don't stop short of a knowledge of God. Allow the Lord Jesus Christ to inhabit your heart. That is your greatest impassable need. That's the trouble that is looming on the horizon for those of us who will not accept Christ. Would you come to Jesus tonight if you do not know him as your personal Savior? Please, in this moment, come to the Lord. Christians, we need not to doubt God. By all means, let's not grow bitter at the Lord. By all means, let's not allow our trouble to make us bitter with other people. We would agree with the songwriter, our way may twist and turn, but God makes no mistakes. Will you agree with the Lord about that tonight? Some of us need to give in to the Lord. Some of us have come to wit's end. And we need to tell God, we're sorry for trying to muscle up underneath it. We're try sorry for trying to make our own way. We're sorry for trying to be strong. We need to find his strength in our weakness. Are you broken yet? Are you broken yet? And maybe that's why God's allowed some of the difficult situations in your life. So that you would finally say yes to the Lord. And utter those precious words that our Savior uttered in the Garden of Gethsemane.
Not my will, but thine be done. Not my will, but thine be done. Would you stand with me, please, as the instruments begin to play? 456, I need thee every hour. The altars are open. If the Lord's spoken to your heart, why don't you move this way and have some time with the Lord? Move this way. Have some time with the Lord. You may want someone to pray with you. Does God speak in your heart? Sometimes we're just too proud to bend, bend down and just say, Lord, I give. I quit. I'm, I'm done. I can certainly testify of being in that place. I go back there way too often. Just too proud to let God break me. Oh, I need thee. are coming to this altar, I want you to, God lead you, I want you to take your time. It's beginning to break. Let it break wide open. Don't be ashamed of tears and brokenness. place you and I can be in in our life is realizing how much we need the Lord. Best place that we can be. I need the oh I need the every hour I need the oh bless me now my Savior I continue to play. It's a quiet, holy moment. Let God have his way. You may be even dealing, like the song said, with temptations that seem to have power over you. We need the Lord to break those strongholds in our lives. It's 456 in the hymnal. If you're able to take that hymn book and open it, I'd like you to take a look at that with me. We're going to sing a verse or two in just a moment as God is dealing with people. We're not in a hurry. God is still speaking to hearts. God's still speaking to you, waiting for you to respond. It's 456. We're going to sing a verse or two of this in just a moment. Beautiful chorus, I need thee, oh, I need thee. me now my 
pray to the Lord and ask God to work in our heart and I hope by God's grace he'll continue to work in our lives and this, is, this is a door we, many of us still need to walk through we're going to find God's best on the other side we've got to be willing to walk through this door in this day of trouble God in heaven we call out to thee we cry out to thee Lord thank you for bringing us to impossible situations or it's difficult to say, but thanking you, thank you, Lord, for allowing our heart to be broken. We thank you, Lord, for allowing our dreams to be ripped away from us. And, Lord, even though we don't like it, Lord, we, we know that your way is perfect. And, Lord, I pray continue to work in my life, continue to sanctify me. Lord, thy way in the sanctuary, sanctify me, make me more holy, more like thee. Lord, help us to trust thy way in the sea when we can't see what's going on. Help us to believe you, Lord, that you're with us in these storms that you'll, you'll bring us through. Lord, I pray for our people that we would be surrendered to you. Lord, I pray that you would help us to continue to surrender and yield to thee by thy spirit. Work in our lives. Help us to become the Christians that you saved us to be by thy grace, even in the day of trouble. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. and amen.